I'm Jamie Knight, and um, today I'm going to be talking to you about autism, the other house, and a concept that I've been thinking of called integrated accessibility. So I'm going to start off with a little bit about myself. So um, basically, uh, I'm Jamie, and um, I'm 21. Um, I'm uh, on the autism spectrum. I'm diagnosed Asperger's slash HFA, I function in autism. And um, the biggest way that it affects me is I sometimes have trouble speaking. Now I do realise it's a bit ironic standing in front of a group of people going, I have trouble speaking, but that's not the situation I'm trouble with. Uh, excessive background noise, um, excessive stress, and I become non-verbal. That's why I've signed very badly um, in the middle. I use assistive technology to help myself communicate. I also have issues with getting things in the right order and uh, social stuff. So um, I was diagnosed with Asperger's uh, when I was very little. And then it was changed to HFA and I was doing the other This lovely chap, and uh, also the name of my company, is Lion. Um, he will talk about me a little bit later, a bit more later, but um, Lion's five years old and he goes everywhere with him basically. So Lion helps me to communicate to people around me. And, uh, Lion has his own obsessions, uh, mostly antelope and smarties. So if you have any smarties about your person, I'll, I'll keep them relatively hidden. Um, and uh, it's also the name of my company. My company is called Plus Line and we do auditing and stuff like that. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is um, it's kind of hard to explain because it's kind of an amalgamation of lots of thoughts we've had for a while. But when I was hunting around and thinking, what's a really good kind of explanation to start this off with? I found this quote by Arthur C. Clark. Um, Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from the magic. I quite like it because it talks about technology in a way that's slightly abstract. And I think it's true. When something really does perform, it disappears. You no longer see it. And it does act like magic. So, going on to today's presentation in itself, I'm going to go through three areas. I want to talk about what I think integrated accessibility is. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think the iPad is a great example of integrated accessibility. And I'm going to talk about the future of integrated accessibility where I think it's going to go, and how devices and uses will evolve over time. So I suppose that gets started. So this first bit is about what the hell is integrated accessibility. Now, it's a term I've half made up, because I can't find a combination of terms that really describe what I want to talk about. Now, I'm not a scholar, so it could be that there is a term for it, and I've just got it wrong. So here's my bash at defining it. So, Integrated accessibility is made up of two elements, really. You have the device or the tool, and then you have the thing that it helps you do, which could be uh, a function, or could be better defined as the use. So the idea is that you have a device or a tool that's not specifically designed to be adapted, that ends up having a, a secondary use due to some characteristic about it. It's a little bit vague in there, so I thought I'd concrete it out with a couple of examples. So, my first set of examples is the Elevate Kitchen Tools. Um, so, the Elevate Kitchen Tools, in case you don't know, uh, they're basically tools for weighted handles, with the idea being if you get them messy, then they don't stick on the side. They're, of course, physical characteristics, highly accessible, they're easy to hold, easy to grip, nice to hold, etc. But you see, the bit that I think is integrated accessibility, the bit that takes it a little bit further, is that because they're colour coded, you can start using them to write colour coded cookbooks. Because they're colour coded, you can write a colour coded cookbook, you start having more confidence in the kitchen. Great confidence leads to new experiences, leads to more control of your own life, of what you want to choose to eat, what you want to choose to do, and ultimately, it leads to better empowerment and more independence for people with disabilities, although the actual item themselves was never designed to be an adapted item. So do you get the general gist of where I'm going with this? Just as a show, lots of people nodding, that's, that's encouraging. My next example is a washing machine that's from space, or at least I'm pretty sure it's from space. So it's the moon washing machine and its control panel is a circle, it's one button. So you turn it on, you select what you want. Um, I actually have a sticker over every other panel and just a sticker that says this one because everything gets washed on the same pattern. Now, again, this ease of use helps everybody. But with the specific case of autism in mind, it helps because it helps reduce the stress. 
because man being able to run a washing machine isn't all you do to manage laundry. But being confident in that section enables you to build a plan for doing the rest of it. So managing the drying cycle, how long it would take, uh, splitting clothes, for example, where we split by black, white or coloured. Because it's much easier than trying to decide if something is light or dark, because you're dealing with absolute terms. So from that managing, managing laundry, because the device is very right clear, because we can then build a clear instruction around it, we can then build a clear manual. And again, this leads to enhanced independence and empowerment for the individual. So that's my stab at defining what I mean by integrated accessibility. Where, where I'm trying to go with this. Now, why would we try and apply this to the iPad? So, in my, when I was being asked to write an introduction to this, um, I said the, the first thing that struck me about the iPad was really subtle. Um, and it was that if you press the home button three times, a voiceover turns on. Now, that means that someone picking it up from the box needs to know something. But as soon as they do, you don't need someone to set it up. Um, I want some users who have large signals, uh, site problems. And it's actually very frustrating that they cannot install Windows, for example, XP. You, know, you can't install it yourself. Which means that they can end up being limited, not by the lack of, but by the lack of accessible technology. The iPad was different to this, because you can kind of tell that they thought about it in the software stack, as, as you discussed earlier, and also in the physical device. So that's where I'm going to start with this talk about the iPad stack. So the device itself is, again, easy to use. Um, it doesn't have recessed buttons. You can find them by feel. Um, it has a definitive way up by where the home button is, where the, 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 the sleep button is. Um, it's actually gone to many devices that should have a definitive way up. Trying to figure out which way up they're supposed to go can actually be very difficult. Um, there is a, it's a little meme, but it is very true. If you ever want to really confuse an autistic kid, give him a round bowl and tell him to put it up the way around. Um, so it's had me gone for about 25 minutes, resulting in breaking the bowl. This definition means that for somebody who, like myself, is very peculiar and very precise about how things should be, there is a definitive way for it to be. So although that's an ease of use for everyone being able to find the buttons, because it, it takes it a step further, it is a lot more flexible. It's also very portable. You don't need to carry around a large computer system. Um, it's powered with portability. Um, it can run speech, speech synthesis software and it can run it well, which I think is part of that today. Um, it can run day-to-day -day applications, movie playback. You know, these things are still important. It's long living, battery life, but at this point I'm basically reading inspection. Uh, I've already spoken about that. Now, consistency is something I'm going to come back to quite a lot. And, um, the presentation that I saw before this one also talked about the consistency of the Apple iOS experience. There's also a consistency in the devices. If you've used the iPad 1, you can use the iPad 2. If you've used the iPhone, you can use the iPod Touch. Um, pretty much any iOS device you can move from and to by the same tactile feedback, by the same rules, you, you, know, you know the home button system. It's easy to understand. Yeah. There's no... Uh, somebody was talking about it earlier. There's no functionality that's hidden away. Um, well, apart from the search box or things we need to scroll down with. But that's another issue. So that's the device, but what have we got about the actual software itself? Now, I know these things can apply to much software, many areas of software, but for the iPad, they seem relatively unique in the tablet, as well, the tablet space. It's actually stable. I've played now with or seven Android tablets. We tested a couple of them with Zoom um, with people and it constantly crashes. Constantly. Um, there's quite few users, so when you Google something, when you try and find a solution, you're not able to because there's not that nobody else is trying to use it while they're using it. So that bug hasn't been found yet. It's popular, which brings with it the advantage of being popular, for example, price, um, availability. Um, software developers, for example, there's a community behind it. If we're using it for this, other people are probably using it for this. It includes many of the software access features right on it. It's got voiceover included, which is, if you don't know, a screen reader. 
um, white on black display, uh, zooming, um, and everything else. It does some quite cool rotation stuff as well. Um, so the software, we don't have to add anything to it to get that base level of compatibility. Because as discussed earlier, if someone's got a disability, they may have Asperger's or autism, they also may also be partially sighted. And a lot of the technology that's out there for, um, for example, uh, communication, AOC systems, assume that you're well sighted. So rather than using larger images, they assume that you're able to read words or that you're able to uh, do very small motor movements. And finally, it's mainstream. Um, this morning, I, I, I had a bit of a problem because I was sat on a train and I'd got the wrong tickets. But because it was a mainstream device, I was able to go, go into my bag, pick up the iPad and go, right, where's my, what's my emergency process set? Because I have a, uh, basically a, a big file full of what to do if. And I have one for getting stopped on the train. Yeah? So I was able to go through that with the ticket inspector and we sort of start solution. Because it's mainstream, it doesn't matter if I'm sat on the train with an iPad. Most people, well, not most people, but you can sit on trains with iPads. The alternatives, a giant red folder, what I used to have, where you'd have to heave over the side and go through a couple of dozen bits of paper, or a laptop, or even some phones. You know, the iPad has that nice mixture of size and portability, and it's just a good format for it. It works really well. And finally, it's secure, or to be more accurate, it's secure enough. I can pin code it, and it won't get read by my mum. The iOS does have some security issues, so like you can get in jail by Google, but then no. There's enough people hitting it that they, they come out of the woodwork quite quickly. Finally, the actual meat of this talk. So it's the use of purposes for which I personally use the iPad, um, that the people told me about, but have more to do with adaptive technology than to do with what it was designed for. As I discussed in the introduction, the big one for me is communication. So um, I'm happy to demonstrate this later. I use a piece of software called Prolog Way to Get, which gives me a voice. When I'm unable to talk, or unable to get words out, it enables me to very quickly generate speech, make my will be known, you know, and to communicate. From communication comes participation. From the participation in the decisions about me, I can then be empowered. And then from that empowerment, from being able to make decisions about what I want, and then it leads to greater independence. Another strong area for the iPad, mostly due to its size, is uh, visual timetables. So um, many people with Asperger's or on the autism spectrum uh, work well with visual timetables. So rather than having simply a timetable that says Wednesday we're doing this, uh, standard icons, consistent imagery, um, so for example photos of your bedroom, or at bedtime, those sorts of things. It just is a lot easier to remember. We know what's coming up next, we know what's happened before, and it helps keep the stress and anxiety down. Another one which is specifically one for that I find quite difficult, it's tracking medication. I'm terrible at it. So having the ability to come through and track it in real time is very useful. And of course, lots of people have that use. But we can take it a step further. Because the device is, I'm going to say the word cheap, but it is compared to some of the dedicated systems for this, um, a very small group of developers can get together and customise software for it. But it's a mainstream device still. So tracking medication is a good one. And of course, for my independent living tasks, a big one for me is cooking. I have all my recipes on it, I have my worry book on it. Um, okay, have it. I have, come and find me, and I'll show you various apps I've got. I've got so many I can't even remember them. Um, I'm doing that thing, I'm trying to think of an example, and mine goes blank. There's probably an app for that somewhere. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that, that's the iPad. I think it's a great example of integrated accessibility, because it's a mainstream device that doesn't have it's not its primary use, it's not an adaptive device, it's not a special medical device. It's a gadget that you can use beyond what it's designed for. Now, that's all well and good. Now, there are lots of other options, like the iPad, Android, and these, these systems will develop. But for a moment, I want to consider beyond devices we have now, beyond tablets, beyond cooking utensils, and think about what, what, what's really the best device to have these adaptions, to have these second, second abilities. I'm going to do that, that thing that people tell you never to do. I'm going to talk about the future. I'm going to try and make some predictions. 
So, ipto de facto, everything I say is going to be wrong. <laughs> but let's, let's give this a go. So, I want your feedback on this, please. So, my first one is, have you improved the device or the tool? What, is there a single or a, 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 a limited collection of, let's say, 10 tools or 5 tools, which we could put in a pack that enables 90% of independent living activities? Um, Joseph and Joseph, people make the uh, uh, elevated utensils, make something they call the uni tool. Uh, which is a knife, a spoon, a uh, sponger, um, all in one. It's flame proof, you can put it in the oven, it won't melt. It's fantastic. Because rather than me going, uh, I need to keep track of a knife in my kitchen, I can just have one tool. Is there something else that we can go along those lines? Is there a universal sitting place? Is there a universal movement place? Is there something that can be adapted? You know, I don't know if you've ever seen a Segway. Um, I know that in the US, quite a lot of those say the New segments, so if they're shot in action, they get given a segment, um, which I think is quite a nice use for that sort of mobility issue. How can, encourage and in, how can encourage development of assistive technology when there sometimes isn't really a market for it? Do we need, uh, would, would the ideal device there be something that you can develop on it? Because you can't develop an iPad app on an iPad. Would uh, uh, there be a system called HyperCards, you know, where you can link data together? Could some sort of what you see is what you get app development, just to enable simple workflows and simple decision tricks, be hugely powerful and maybe with people with independence. For example, with cooking, could it, it's not hugely simple, it's not hugely complicated for an application which I can program with a carer or with someone assisting me and then refer to it in the future. What about device convergence? We're always being told that your phone and your laptop and your house is all going to converge into one place. How does this look going forward? Are we going to expect to find um, our digital devices converging in the same way? And then there's, um, what, what do you think the characteristics of both What do you think? Any ideas? Any, what, if, if you're trying to think about a device that isn't designed, per se, to be, except isn't designed to be adaptive and special, but could be generic and then used in a, in a an assistive way to promote independence. As I said, this concept's still a little bit vague in my world. Yeah? I think it should look good. I think it should have even design. Even design? Definitely, yeah. You can see that. Sort of ball school, isn't it? Ball school carry it. Well, at least it needs to have a portable element. Because I was thinking of this the other day. Um, something you can take with you so you have that constant state. But also, if you're going to, you know, if you go home, you can plug it into other things. Um, I was thinking of the idea of wouldn't it be cool if, if I watch TV? Um, it's quite a common Asperger's thing. I quite like Tom's tank engine. So, yeah, just do. And um, it would be quite cool if when I've watched something, I could take it home and know that it's watched when I plug into the telly, or know it's watched. Maybe if I'm, I've got instructional videos, for example, um, being able to track what I've watched. Um, what, which ones I've used, how often I've used them, you know, how many times have I used that cooking pasta again? That sort of information would be really valuable. So yeah. Any other ideas? Yeah, I think like one of the emerging things that's really exciting about like the iPhone and iPad is all of the um, smart environments and augmented reality. Mm -hmm. So some really simple things are like um, we made a video at Ability Net with uh, Rory and Johan who were both partially sighted and they were talking about um, when you go to visit a new place and you can't see the street signs and you can't read the map. So, you know, a, a smart device that's accessible is just, you know, wonderful. Um, it, um, like you say, it's, it increases independence. I think that's the important thing. I suppose being on the spectrum of independence is something that I don't take for granted. And I wouldn't be independent without all the little tricks I've developed to do it. Um, at the same time, you know, as we were saying with augmented reality, there are some very, very cool apps um, out there for identification. So um, I think it's seen screen, to be wrong there. Seen something. And um, it enables you to take a photo of a place 
and then draw boxes over what different things are. So I have one of my kitchen, which says fridge food, you know, preparation area, hot area, don't go there. <laughs> and I don't need it most of the time. But just knowing it's there, if I do, just need that little bit of reassurance to go, uh, where's the knives? Yeah. It, it's there and I can use it. So, yeah, I think even if you're not using it, knowing it's there, knowing it's available or acceptable, I think it's really, really powerful. So that's the, the future of device, but we've also got the future of uses. So if this has got two sides to it, the device, the tool, and then the actual item itself, or how, how you're using it, we, you've just discussed there some of the you know, uses of uh, augmented reality for location awareness issues. What other, is, what other things are there that can come forward? So one of the ones I think is one of the areas that kind of needs movement now is awareness among support services. Um, I was visiting a National Autism National Society place a couple of weeks ago, and um, they were still buying £2,000 ago communication systems, because that's what they'd always bought. You know, there was nobody there actively looking out for better solutions. Showed them where the quote to go, and they were literally on the Apple store as I left, going, yeah, we'll have three. You know, so a lot of the time it was raising awareness that this other technology is out there. So coming from the web design dis discipline or the you know, software development discipline and getting it into the hands of the users who need it, or, as is often the case, their carers, because at the end of the day, they're the people who are currently making decisions. Another area is syncing and communication between devices. I still get incredibly frustrated that I have exactly the same piece of software on my iPhone and on the iPad to help you talk. They don't sync. The only way that I can sync them is to export from one and import to the other. They're both connected. <laughs> Surely there is a way of sending that little bit of data up to the internet and pulling it back out. Yeah. These sorts of issues, these sorts of complete picture issues, are, are a real area for this, this sort of place to expand in the future. And then finally, once we've, once we've got this sort of technology available, maybe it's time to stand by and start looking at, OK, well, what's the guidelines there? If we expect the National Awesome Society or any other organisations to roll out this technology, maybe we need to start giving them guides on how to do it effectively. Maybe we need to start talking about, okay, iOS is very cool, but how do you keep it secure in an environment with 27 kids? How do you keep these items safe? How do you keep these items reliable? What happens if one fails? These sorts of issues still need to be explored, talked about, and developed. Now, I wanted to leave on uh, an ending note. So, I wanted to tell you that this technology to me, um, it empowers me, and the power leads to greater confidence. The greater confidence leads to my independence. For me, that's magic. Thank you. Any questions or feedback? With regard to Jamie, to, to do with synchronisation of stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, um, do you mean something in like, you know, in something like Dropbox or something like that? It could be Dropbox, yeah. or it could be a, a service that works for a specific category of apps. I suppose for me, I'm trying to imagine an, I, an iPad app. So it's an iPad app to make very simple iPad apps that then syncs across everything that's Yeah. So, you know, I'm kind of trying to think a little bit further out than necessarily the technology we have now. Does the, does the sort of the iOS, does it block that sort of synchronization? Yes. Or does. Well, no, it doesn't block the synchronization, it has to be built by the people who are building the app. So a lot of them use Dropbox, because right. Dropbox made a public API for it. Um, but some of the issues are things like um, my envisioned iPad app that builds other simpler iPad apps. Yeah. It's not that, because right. it has to do some form of code generation. So, you know, so there are issues. Um, I'm quite excited about Android, because Google developed uh, what you see is what you get app developed for. Yeah. Um, which I gave it a go, but it wasn't so robust. But I can see that being something that's useful in the future. You think Android could take over if it, if it becomes more robust and more, and, uh, more stable? I don't know. That's a much larger question than just for just me. Really. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to uh, a talk on Android at RNIB a couple of weeks ago, and there was, um, the, the, there was a quite a few people that I don't know much about Android but just passing on what they said it's a long long way behind iPhone um, there's the, the, there's going to be a screen reader with an accessibility API but as as it is at the moment there's no zoom 
there's no, you can't change the colour contrast and you can't increase the text size. So until you can do those things, it's kind of like that, you know, there's miles behind. Is that, is that because it's not on Google's radar? Yeah, uh, apparently um, uh, uh, the problems with Google, apparently because of the architecture of the touch screen um, yeah. and um, the chap who was giving the tour said that there's no plans at all in the immediate future for Google to address it, which means that we're not going to get a, a magnifier. It's just crazy. It's like Chrome, a lot of Chrome, they took the accessibility layer out of it just for performance and never put it back. So they might have put it back in. Does anybody know if they finally put it back in? Possibly not. The other side of it, of course, is the Google one. It's totally true. That's um, not true. To build on what I said earlier, there's the consistency across applications. That's just not their Android tool. Um, I said we, we tried out the Zoom um, plan. It didn't go very well because the, so like the contacts application on there was from a phone. And it was very obviously from a phone, only working on orientation, portrait. But the Exhumed white screen, so it really doesn't need to be held in the landscape. And then there was things like, um, we couldn't find the power button. You know, and we all spent about five minutes, when we first took out the box going, where's the power button? How do I wake this up? You can't pick it up and press something off you. There's a little button that's recessed around the back that you have to push really hard and it doesn't click. Yeah. So there's still a lot of, development of these sorts of things to go. But whether as for Android will overtake iOS in the future, that's a huge, huge topic of debate. Um, but I don't think when it comes to accessibility it will. But it, as it's open source, it only takes one company to go with me, that's the resources to do it. So they can turn around very quickly. Ubuntu can. They went, we can, we'll invest the resources to make this more accessible. And it really turned around very quickly. So, <laughs> any other questions? Really, talking about the um, education because uh, one of them is sort of wary of this is quite advanced technology for community it is. So, so the for people to, to really get benefit of this, but the seeds are um, um, lots and lots of education training and things like that. And of course, there's um, like you said, World 21, and then um, the budget is what 80 years or something, you know, so there's um, 60, 70. And people much older who, who would benefit from There are, and I suppose there's kind of two sides to the education side. There's the users, um, who we've tended to find, kind of regardless of age, especially with the iPad, tend to be quite happy. The odd thing is we never told them it was a computer. We just <laughs> didn't mention that. We just went, this is really cool. Well, have you played with this? Um, believe it or not, Solitaire and what's the game? I've even been connected for for our biggest ways of getting people, you know, liking it. So we go, do you want to play Connect 4? Fine, we're going to get out of the box, we've got that like it. You, know. you can't really do that with a hunking rate of computer. Do you want to play Connect 4? No problem. Click it, you know. So I think there's that side of it. So there's the users, also adoption of the Wii, you know, older people's homes and stuff. There's the users. But then there's the actual industry that supports the users, most of which are quite entrenched in really quite old ways of doing things. So um, I used to live in support of living. And uh, they hand wrote notes every day, locked them in the filing cabinet, and then burnt them when we left. At no point were they ever shared. At no point were they ever reviewed. So why were they making them? Oh, because we have to for compliance. Okay? So, you know, it's things like this. So there's that side of it. There's also motivating stuff. Because I think, I was saying this something earlier, when, when we're trying to find people with cognitive issues who want to help with testing, actually getting them to decide that they've had a problem that isn't their fault is actually remarkably difficult because there's something that I've always found is I always assume that I've done something wrong. You know? um, and actually sometimes it can take me a while to go, oh hang on a minute, the door handles on backwards. You know, I'll, I'll first assume that I'm pushing and pulling, you know, so once you kind of get into that mindset of I'm always doing things wrong, it can actually be quite hard to identify when it's not your fault. <laughs> you know. um, and then there's the actual educating staff. Mm -hmm. There's good staff and there's bad staff. There are staff who are interested in the interests of the people. There are staff who are interested in doing as little as they can during their shift. 
I think the balance of how many of each in many places is 50 50, or more skewing towards people are there to fill space. It's a bit sad, but from our experience working in seven places I have done with organisation that was generally the, the issue, was there were six or seven members of staff who really knew their staff. And most of the rest of the staff were there between new years, between, and they, weren't, they weren't invested in developing the skills to develop and empower the people they were. Jim, just an, another point as well is that in the um, in, the, in the talking with uh, working with users of multiple sclerosis, they were telling me that um, these days if you're newly diagnosed, um, a lot of the nurses uh, recommend you to get an iPhone because it's um, the best way to um, manage injections as well because you, you have to do a, a lot of injections and stuff and that's that's amazing as well look it's almost becoming like a a, a living aid but if you know yeah without this thing this one probably probably live without the iPad mm -hmm. or I could live without the phone both and I'll, I'll, I'll be completely mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit worrying this thing tells me where I'm supposed to be and everything um, which is why a couple of times when I've lost it I've been completely devastating um, which again comes back to the one back up the um, I, I lost uh, so with the protocol to go to build up your own library it learns from how you talk and you know, the sort of phrasing is really good but it doesn't send it anywhere and um, I did not upgrade sorry no I selected up uh, Basically, in iTunes, you can either blank the device and start again, or you can upgrade this off. I picked the wrong one, and I lost it. My fault, they said back up often, but these sorts of glitches really do. Yeah, I agree, they're fantastic little bits of kit. And I think we are moving towards multi purpose devices rather than single purpose devices. Um, when I was little, the assistive technology to speak was uh, literally a desktop computer, uh, gaffer tape or Velcro to the back of a wheelchair um, with an eye tracker because that was the stand, you know, that was about as, as far as they had got there. Um, and it was thousands of pounds. Now, the same thing that I can watch Mythbusters on the train with, I can also refer to, I'm not quite sure what I should, what I should do regarding paying or not paying or, or do I take a, you know, what option do I take it? Also gives me the ability to communicate with people. Um, I, as, uh, I, I met a member of the audience to kind of help get me here from the train station. We were swapping text messages this morning. That's communication on my own terms. It's asynchronous. It's not demanding. Actually, that's really empowering. It's so simple. But it's really empowering versus having because the other, the alternative is I would have to arrange a time to meet with the person, to arrange a certain time and a certain place to pick up, and how would I communicate, you know. So this sort of latent communication is, is another really awesome, autism, autism, awesome thing that helps with autism. Um, 